Rise of the Exile, Book One of the Shadow of the Tyrant King series by J. D. Matter. Chapter 16 The Depths of Gluttony. The soldier threw Lucas and Gigi to the ground. Gigi's all important book, The Ways of Demagorak, went flying. Where's this wand I heard you talking about? asked the oafish soldier. Yeah, where's the wand? Where is it? added a wiry soldier with a rat-like face. His voice was equally rat-like. We don't know, sir, shouted Lucas. The oafish soldier stepped on Lucas's back, squeezing the air out of his lungs. Lucas made a sickly, exhaling sound. He's telling the truth, screamed Gigi. We don't know. Luckily, Gigi's scream distracted the oafish soldier, causing his foot to slightly ease off Lucas. Lucas was therefore able to manage a whisper to Gigi. The old Merryweather plan, wheezed Lucas. Just like before, with the brush. Gigi tried to remember their old conspiracy. Hide the brush from Merryweather's view. Make it obvious that it's hidden from her view specifically. She comes to the trap. Curiosity kills the cat. No, Lucas. Gigi tentatively said. Lucas nodded, encouraging him to continue. Don't show him? It's too late, Gigi. They know, replied Lucas, desperately trying to sound convincing. No, you can't. Gigi became more comfortable with acting. It's too dangerous. They'll have our only weapon. The oafish soldier stepped on Gigi. What weapon? You're about to die, kid. Tell us where this wand of yours is, and we might let you live. Okay, okay, yelled Lucas. I hid it. It's out there, in the hills. The oafish soldier effortlessly picked Lucas completely off the ground. He held him by the shoulders so that they were face to face. Show us, kid, and you better find it, or I'll kill your friend first, right before your eyes. Then I'll kill you. Nice and slow. Honesty was out of the question. Presenting them with a paintbrush from school would hardly be satisfactory. Lucas had another plan, one he dreaded, because he was not confident he and Gigi could even survive it. They headed south toward the open country. His mind strained with what he had done. Colovium was not out there and the soldiers would be furious if he led them to the middle of nowhere with nothing to show for it. If the plan did not work, then he had only postponed their demise. With each new step, he further doubted his course of action. Perhaps he really could deliver the wand. He could say that he actually brought it to school and forgot that it was not hidden in the hills anymore. After all, it was probably still at school. It might still be in the art studio. Gigi could use his book to confirm that it was not, in fact, just a brush. Lucas was about to speak, to tell his new story, but he let the scenario play a little further. The soldiers would still kill them. They would probably kill Mrs. Leafton as well. They might even kill Principal Philip for harboring rebels or hiding magical artifacts. Even still, the wand might not be at school. Then he would surely be killed. Lucas decided to stay on his present course. That way, at least only he and Gigi were in danger. At least they had only four soldiers to contend with rather than the entire legion back at Devonstone. Sadly, their current voyage was their best option. Four large, well-trained soldiers were hardly dismissible. The oafish soldier outranked the others, and the rat-faced soldier was second in command. The other two were quiet. They were lower ranking and seemed a bit skittish. All four walked two by two behind Lucas and Gigi. Their plate armor clinked and clanked loudly. Even though the metal was scuffed, it reflected brilliantly in the daylight. They were an overpowering force from which escape seemed utterly impossible. Even if Lucas and Gigi could outrun them, there was no hope to escape, for the two quiet soldiers carried long bows. The two thirteen-year-olds were heavily outmatched. 
Fear seized Lucas as the soldiers mumbled and grumbled behind them. After a long walk, he changed his mind and decided that their best chance would be to lead the soldiers to the thicket by the Mandalay Creek, Merriweather's sanctuary. If they ran fast enough, the trees might provide enough cover from arrows. They might be able to escape. They continued to walk south and Lucas sensed the soldiers' waning patience. The rat-faced soldier continuously sighed after each rise they walked over. The oafish soldier constantly tore apart pieces of jerky with his teeth and chewed it loudly, smacking and grunting as the meat stuck out of his mouth. Lucas grew very nervous. He did not believe that the soldiers would be willing to go much farther from Devonstone. Lucas saw the thicket in the distance. It's just over there. Lucas waved his hand in the thicket's general direction. It better be, better be, said the rat-faced soldier. There was movement near the thicket. Lucas's godfather trained him to spot subtle movement in the woods. A girl was there, standing near the wood's edge. Lucas squinted. She did not have purple hair. She must have been Wendy Windmill. She must have heard them, for the soldiers were not trying to walk lightly. They allowed their armor to rattle. Why wouldn't they? They were completely superior to anything they might encounter in those hills, especially little girls. She darted into the woods. Fortunately, the soldiers did not see her. Merriweather was sure to be lurking in that thicket as well. They complicated matters. Lucas, Gigi, and their captors were coming very close to that sloping line of trees. It was time for Lucas to decide. The safety of the trees was so close, just a short sprint away. It was definitely a gamble, though. If the soldiers chased them into the thicket, the girls might be caught. Merriweather and Wendy would be severely punished for sneaking out of Devonstone. Even though Merriweather was the lowest form of mucus-dwelling parasites, thought Lucas, he could not bear the thought of bringing the Black Eagle's wrath upon her. Could she run fast enough to escape? Could Gigi run fast? Could he himself be fast enough? Lucas stopped walking, and his entire following clattered to a startled halt. He was sweating and shaking. He looked at the thicket. If he ran, he could never go back to Devonstone. He could never go back to school. This was it. He pivoted slightly to the right, toward the trees. He shifted his weight to the balls of his feet. He could not decide. Well, said the oafish soldier, what'd you stop for? Is it here? Where is it? Lucas did not answer. Don't play with us, kid. The soldier tapped the hilt of his broadsword. I'll stick all this steel right into your belly. Lucas! The sound of Gigi's voice was surprising. You're taking a rest, right? Let's get moving, Lucas. It's just a little farther. Gigi looked at the oafish soldier and pointed at Rook's high hill. It's buried at the top of that hill. All right, then. Let's move! The oafish soldier yelled as he pushed Lucas forward. Gigi decided for him. Apparently, he had more confidence in Lucas's plan than even Lucas himself did. That was reassuring, yet it meant committing to the grand scheme, which was also terrifying. Fortunately, Gigi was more than clever enough to realize Lucas's original intent. He felt gratefulness beyond measure for his immensely sly, crafty, brilliant friend, Gigi. Lucas never thought he would find himself trekking up that steep hill again. The soldiers grunted and struggled in their heavy armor. It was tempting to push them down. The grand mansion atop the hill was abandoned. The Rook estate was transformed from its former splendor into a ruin overgrown with twisting vines. Black scorch marks streaked the white marble, marring its sheen. Clearly, an intense battle occurred there. What is this odd place? asked the rat-faced soldier. This was Rook's place, answered the oaf. She was a fugitive, a witch. Kuroth sent the Red Raiders after her. No one knows what happened to him. She disappeared, and so did them raider boys. One thing's certain, there was definitely a fight up here. Then these runs here must be telling the truth, said the rat face. 
I mean, if there's a powerful wand, it'd be here at a witch's manor. You got a point, said the oaf. We buried it in the back, said Gigi while looking at Lucas. We buried it in the garden. Lucas closed his eyes and tried to mentally prepare himself. Rook had said that over the summer it would grow to enormity, big enough to swallow them whole. They walked past broken columns, down the stairs, and into the garden. Over the summer the garden grew unchecked and became vast and wild. It was a very large, circular area where nothing grew. Lucas and Gigi walked as cautiously as possible without becoming conspicuous, balancing between utter terror and nonchalant ambiguity. It's just there, Gigi pointed at the barren spot. It's buried in that dark soil. All right, then dig it up already, yelled the oaf. He pushed Gigi onto the dirt and Lucas went with him. Their feet sunk deeply into the loose soil. The soldiers followed them. Their size and heavy armor caused them to sink nearly knee-deep. Still, they did not suspect any trickery and continued to follow the boys. They trudged slowly with high knee thrusts as if walking through deep snow. Gigi knelt down and so did Lucas. They pretended to dig while awaiting the sweet smell. The rat-faced soldier noticed it first. Mmm, you smell that? They felt a slight quake. Lucas and Gigi simultaneously leaped up and ran as fast as the dirt would allow. It was almost like trying to run through quicksand. The soldiers bolted after them. Roots shot out of the ground. True to Rook's word, the bone hoard was not the same. It was massive. The roots were knobby, gnarled appendages of unmatched strength. They grasped the horrified soldiers. When the bone horde realized that it had the fortune of an unusually high number of prey, it brought its full arsenal to bear. Hundreds of roots shot up and clumps of dirt flew everywhere. The thing was a tangled, flailing monstrosity. Lucas and Gigi were not prepared for what they had summoned. The soldiers tried to fight back. Roots grabbed their ankles and began to pull them under. More tentacles violently wrapped around their necks. A sudden downpour drenched everything. The world was loud with rain. A frenzy of splashing mud and water ensued. The tentacles became slick in the rain and the men slipped free. More and more roots desperately tried to grasp the soldiers again. Countless tentacles kept erupting out of the dirt. The bone horde's true mass began to be revealed as dirt melted away. The soldiers unsheathed their swords. Slicing blades came, gleaming. The severed tentacles banged loudly against their armor, smearing green upon them. The bone horde considered their fight to be remarkable. Such a ravenous plant, however, could not be stopped. The two quiet soldiers were completely tied up. The roots scooped out graves for them and pulled them under. Their screams were muffled by mouthfuls of mud. They were gone, and the bone horde was glad to have something to feed on. With two soldiers down, there were more roots available to strangle the rat-faced soldier. At least he was above ground when he died. Lucas and Gigi thought they were completely free from harm. They were wrong. The bone horde had not forgotten about the very first steps that alerted it. A special elongated root protruded and stretched quickly toward the boys. It caught Gigi's ankle and he crashed to the ground. Lucas dropped and tried to pry him free, which was fruitless. Meanwhile, the bone horde recoiled from the oafish soldier's onslaught. He slashed furiously and was causing damage. The bone horde thus employed its final weapon. Its grand, ugly head emerged from the soil. Its grisly mouth revealed rows of sharp teeth-like thorns and strings of sticky green saliva. Its shrill squeal was alarming. It snapped up the oafish soldier and chewed on him. The soldier managed to keep his sword, and he stabbed the bulbous, vile head. The air became a green mist. The sweet smell was gone and instead replaced with a putrid stench. It could not chew through the soldier's armor. 
The bone horde made a rattling noise that shook the ground and sent dust falling in the mansion. It spit out the oafish soldier, and he flew out of the garden. The bone horde wanted nothing more to do with the wretched man. It still had a tender thirteen-year-old, though. Easy prey. The tendril dragged Gigi toward the bone horde's hungry jaws. Lucas saw a fallen sword and dashed into the danger zone. He barely managed to scoop up the blade. A root shot at him, but he sliced through it. The sword, backed by Lucas's full power, chopped down upon the elongated root. It did not sever, but gushed slime from the wedge-shaped cut. The bone horde whined, and its precious root retracted. Gigi was freed. He scuttled backwards on hands and feet before getting up proper. They sprinted away from the nightmarish plant. They escaped one terror, only to find another, for the oafish soldier was waiting for them, and he was furious. Chapter 17 A New Family The oafish soldier looked like something that crawled out of a swamp. He was covered with dripping green muck, mud, and bleeding cuts. His face was insanely furious and wide-eyed. Lucas wildly swung his sword. The first swing missed, and the momentum nearly caused him to fall. The soldier seemed wholly unthreatened and continued his advance. Lucas swung again and connected with the man's breastplate, clanging loudly. The sword bounced harmlessly off his armor. The recoiling blade flew from Lucas's hand, singing like a tuning fork. Lucas and Gigi bolted, but the soldier managed to grasp a fistful of Lucas's shirt. As it tore, Lucas slammed to the ground. Gigi reluctantly stopped and faced the desperate situation. They were beside a heavy marble slab, part of the floor that had broken and was pushed up like tectonic plates forming a mountain range. Gigi mumbled incantations and raised his hands as if he were lifting the gargantuan chunk of marble. The mental strain was debilitating, for he had never tried to levitate something so heavy, much heavier than their beagle Flippy. The stone slowly rose, bits of detritus slid off. He intended to drop it on the man, but it floated upward much too slowly. There was not going to be enough time to save Lucas that way. The oafish soldier had retrieved Lucas's fallen sword. He raised it high above his head and looked as though he was going to enjoy crushing it down upon Lucas. The death blow was coming. An arrow suddenly thudded into his armpit. The oaf screamed and fell over. As Lucas began to scramble, he looked toward the arrow's point of origin and was glad to see his friend Justim standing upon the open lawn, bow in hand. Justim started to knock another arrow as the soldier got up and broke the shaft from his armpit. It seemed nothing could stop the madman. Justim's armpit arrow, however, had given Gigi the time he needed. The huge chunk of marble was now high above the mad soldier. Gigi let it go. The soldier's crumpling body hardly slowed the marble's momentum as it crashed down upon him. It crushed the soldier so completely that it was impossible to tell if he really was beneath the slab or had disappeared from reality altogether. It looked like merely another piece of debris upon the ground. Don't ever mess with a mage! said Gigi. His voice wavered into a tremble. Not only were they safe at last, but they could go home. The soldiers would remain missing forever. Perhaps they would be written off as deserters, but one thing was certain. Thirteen-year-olds would be unlikely suspects. Justin hustled to his friends. The three boys stared at the marble slab. I can't believe it, said Gigi. I killed someone. When he realized the magnitude and finality of his actions, he became horrified with what he had done. Lucas and Gigi were both shaking and holding back sobs. Their hearts raced. Their stomachs protested whatever madness was occurring outside their bodies and wanted to vomit. They felt physically heavy, and their quivering knees were somehow inadequate for dealing with this strange new weight. Something other than blood seemed to course through their veins, something that was taxing yet empowering. 
They felt like they could either collapse into the fetal position or take on the world. He had it coming, said Justum. He maintained his natural calmness, which seemed inhuman. He didn't give you much choice, did he? No, I suppose not, Gigi started crying. You saved me. Lucas was still breathing heavily. Both of you. Thank you. Lucas and Gigi stared at Justin for a moment. Justin, where'd you come from? I couldn't help it. Justin looked at the ground as he spoke. I was just so curious about what you two were talking about and why I couldn't know. Just plain nosy, I guess. I caught up with you just in time to see them soldiers messing with you. I had to follow you. Where did you get that bow? asked Gigi. We just left school. Gigi, you haven't figured me out at all, have you? I'm a rogue. I got all sorts of things stashed everywhere. I'm always prepared for anything. Anything. Oh yeah, that ain't all I stashed, by the way. I picked up your magic book and hid it in the bushes. Justum, if you were a girl, I'd kiss you, said Gigi. But you'd have to be a lot prettier. Come on, we better hurry back to Devonstone. The rainy walk back to town was thankfully uneventful. Lucas and Gigi were still shaking and felt queasy, but the walk home gave them some time to regain enough composure to at least look calm on the outside. During the walk, they described the immensity and grotesqueries of the bone horde to Justum, who missed the encounter. He looked disappointed to be deprived of the experience. Lucas and Gigi, however, were happy and amazed to be uninjured. Simply being alive was invigorating. As they came closer to Devonstone, they fleshed out their alibi, which they needed almost immediately. Another Black Eagle patrol of four soldiers spotted them as Lucas, Gigi, and Justin entered Devonstone. Hey, what you three doing out there? yelled a soldier. Justin was most comfortable with lying, so he did the talking. We thought you knew, sir. Just out hunting. Justin displayed his bow as proof. Oh, never mind, replied the soldier. It's Luke and Timmy. But who's that you got with you? He's no hunter. That's just Gigi. We're showing him how to track and all. You can't never have enough hunters out there. So where's your catch, almighty hunter? Sorry, we didn't get anything this time. But Justum held back a grin as he thought of the oaf. Well, well. The soldier looked toward the sky, trying to think of something that sounded official. That'll be a game fee. A game fee, sir? Yeah, twenty silver for leaving town and not bringing anything back. The boys rustled for pocket change and managed fifteen. That'll do. The soldier held out an open hand and impatiently wiggled his fingers. Give it here. The boys dropped the clinking change into his greedy hand and they were allowed to go in peace. If their burdens of late were pulling them into an ocean's dark depths, then they felt as though they were suddenly cut loose and washed up on a warm, sandy beach of relief. Devonstone, though oppressed as it was, seemed like a dream. They headed for Lucas's house. When they turned down Maple Street, they were surprised to see Blake and his parents, Fuga and Gretchen Leatherhide, sitting on the front porch of Lucas's house. Lucas, Gigi, and Justin slowed their gait. They did not know what to expect. Hey, fellas, where have you been? Blake's voice was unnaturally high and innocent-sounding. Gretchen got up with a grunt and approached the boys with certain giddiness, the way a little girl might approach a box brimming with kittens. Blakey, honey, aren't you gonna introduce us? It was obvious where Blake got his looks. Both of his parents resembled him, wide and tall. Ma, Blake whined. Don't call me that. Um, ma'am, said Lucas. This is Gigi and Justin, and I'm Lucas. None of that ma'am business. Call me Gretch. Yes, ma'am. Gretch. Blakey has told me so much about you three. Oh? Yep, said Mr. Leatherhide. And knowing what we know, and judging by the looks of you, I'd say you three were into a bit of mischief. Gretchen smacked him on the arm. Oh, 
I'm Fuga, by the way, Blake's dad. Uh, You can call me Blake's dad. Mr. Leatherhide was the only one laughing. Well, said Lucas, we'd be happy to tell you what happened, he started whispering. But we probably shouldn't talk about it in public. Just as well, said Gretchen. You're coming to our house tonight anyways. You can tell us about it there over dinner. Oh, thank you, but no arguing. I ain't having you and Timmy out by your lonesome, least not till your godparents turn up. That's right, I know all about it. Your teacher, Mr. Clovenhoofy, stopped by and told me that you and Timmy were living here all alone. I won't have any friends of Blakey's out fending for themselves like wild animals. Ma, don't call me that. Oh, Blakey, Blakey, Blakey. Blake knew to shut up when his mother's hands moved to her hips. I believe, said Gigi, that Mr. Clovenhoof went to see my parents as well. Say, your real name ain't Gigi, is it? asked Fuga. You Jimacoodalus? Geraticus. That's right, Gretchen snapped her fingers. And what did Lucas call Timmy? Just him? Yes, answered Lucas. He doesn't have a last name. He's just Tim. Gretchen chuckled for a moment before turning back to Gigi. Yeah, Clovenhoofy mentioned that he was gonna stop by and talk with your folks, Gigi. Gigi's your nickname, huh? I like it. Real cute. We're gonna help look after Lucas and Timmy. You think your mom and pop might chip in? The more the merrier. Possibly. Gigi was not sure how his parents would react. Sometimes they were too upper class for their own good. That was Mr. Cloven Hoofy's hope, anyhow. Right, fella. Let's get going. Gracious, you three need some meat on your bones. And you're positively filthy. What's that green goo on your clothes? They all walked to Blake's house, mindful to keep some distance from each other as they walked, so as not to congregate in public and attract more soldiers. Gigi ran ahead to his house to ask his parents permission to spend the night at Blake's with Lucas and Justin. Gigi was happy when they allowed him to go. Furthermore, they told Gigi about Mr. Clovenhoof's visit. They also told Gigi to tell his friends that they would be more than happy to provide them with some necessities. Though his parents felt gracious, Gigi felt they were somewhat selfish, especially after meeting Blake's parents, who were poor. Necessities had the essence of bare minimum, impersonal charity. Gigi hid his frustration with them, tried to look grateful, and said good night. They had a big dinner when everyone arrived at the Leatherhide's house. Lucas, Justin, and Gigi were sure that Gretchen was trying to stuff them to death. She was accustomed to maintaining Blakey's girth. During dinner, the three boys told their tale of the soldiers and the bone hoard. Gretchen's expression was as horrified as if she personally witnessed everything. Mr. Leatherhide, however, was preoccupied with eating and was committed only to the occasional obligatory empathetic head shake. Blake's reaction was another matter. Well, slap me hard and call me a baby's ass. I missed it. Did you just say that at my table? Sorry, Ma. It wasn't exactly fun, Blake, replied Gigi. Yeah, but I would have loved to see some of them black eagle bite it. You said it, Blake, added Justin. It was poetic, mate. Mr. Leatherhide grunted his approval. Gigi was disconcerted by their nonchalant attitudes. People died because of them. Lucas was torn. He too was disturbed by the deaths. When he thought of his godparents and all those kidnapped infants and pregnant women, however, his remorse greatly lessened. The four boys sprawled out in the living room and fell asleep. Lucas dreamed about snakes strangling him, no doubt an influence of the bone horde. Justin slept soundly. Blake did as well, but briefly dreamt about drowning in a vat of pudding. Gigi dreamed about levitating various objects, which inadvertently affected reality. Throughout the night, real objects, a chair, a table, Mr. Leatherhide, floated momentarily and dropped, waking everyone. Mr. Leatherhide was by far the loudest of dropped objects. 
The next morning, while heading for school, the boys were of one mindset. They wanted to find Colovium, Lucas's wayward wand. Chapter 18. Blind Toads On the way to school the following morning, Blake had an unfortunate encounter with a group of giggly girls who were headed to Vinewood Junior High in the opposite direction. As Blake passed them, several of the girls gagged and held their noses. Blake's skunk smell was made to seem more prominent than it actually was, or the girls had highly sensitive olfactory nerves. Blake stopped and looked longingly at Darlene Millie, who was button-nosed and petite, so petite that she seemed like a different species than Blake. Darlene, at least, was kind enough to not pretend to induce vomiting. She might have even been sympathetic. Oh, forget it, said Justin. That girl is one-fourth your size for crying out loud. Blake shrugged and then turned to Gigi. Don't you know a spell or something that'll get rid of this reek? Perhaps there's something in here we can find that will be useful, said Gigi as he tapped his trusty book. Probably something in the alchemy section. They could hardly wait to get to art class, to ransack the studio for Lucas's brush. History class came first, however, so they had to endure Mr. Colovenhoof's lecture before finding the great wand, Colovium. Though they had plenty of lessons on the Tyrant King last year, Mr. Colovenhoof felt it necessary to reiterate and elaborate on the subject in light of recent events. As you know, said Mr. Clovenhoof, the tyrant is said to have lived for about 530 years. He definitely wasn't Veroxian, so his longevity was attributed to some murky magic. Speaking of Veroxian, uh, some historians believe that the real tyrant was actually his teacher and mentor a Varoxian, whom he learned from in obscurity hundreds of years ago. Now, because he lived so long ago, uh, there is very little evidence to confirm that theory, the theory that the tyrant king was merely a puppet of his master, Demogorok. Now, I personally don't think Gigi almost fell out of his chair. Who? What was that name you just said? Geraticus, I don't appreciate being interrupted. Sorry, Professor, I'm only trying to keep accurate notes here. Demogorok was his name. Supposedly, he was a fallen Varoxian. But, Professor, said Gigi to the groaning teacher, Varoxians are benevolent. Hence the word fallen. For whatever reason, he was exiled from Veroxia. Benevolent, he was not. Apparently, an exception to the rule. As the teacher continued his lecture, Gigi ran his finger over the gold lettering on his book, The Ways of Demagorak. He examined the names of the authors, fifteen of Demagorak's chroniclers. Gigi had read the names before, but he could have sworn that there were fewer. Demagorak needed so many chroniclers because he was thousands of years old, like most Varoxians. Gigi wondered if he was somehow being tainted by the knowledge in his book, for its source was incredibly evil. No, Gigi thought, it's not where the magic came from, but what is done with it that matters. When Mr. Colovenhoof dismissed the class, Lucas, Gigi, Justin, and Blake bolted out of the classroom, through the hall, and barreled into the art studio. There were scores of tin cans filled with brushes of every kind. Blake clumsily tipped a few over, sending brushes rolling across the floor. Mrs. Leafton smiled, believing that their enthusiasm was for art. Derry Thomas stepped on a brush, which rolled beneath his foot and sent him crashing backwards to the floor with his feet high in the air. Blake was going to help him up until he saw who it was. "'What's with you for? Derry said as he got up. "'You gone loopy or something?' Derry reached for a brush and Blake smacked his hand. "'Hey!' "'Go sit down,' said Blake. 
We got first dibs. Got it, yelled Lucas. I got it. He held up the brush and the four boys scrambled to the back of the class. Oh no. The brush was petrified with red paint. It's too far gone. This'll never come out. Relax, Lucas, said Gigi as he cracked open his magic book. I'm certain there's something in here that might remedy this, perhaps in the alchemy section. Alchemy section? said Blake. Say, Gigi, as long as you're in there... Don't worry, Blake, I'll find something for your smell. Which one of you is going to clean up this mess? said Mrs. Leafton. There were a few more accidents. Sorry, Professor, we'll get right on it. After their last class, the boys met again in the hall where there weren't any Black Eagle soldiers to overhear them, and they looked to Gigi. I found a formula for a potion that will turn anything back into its original form, but it's very complicated. We can find some of these ingredients in the chemistry lab, but some are more exotic. Like what? asked Lucas. Ground-up wisp bill, dark wolf whiskers, the eyes of a blind toad. Blake chuckled. I ain't crawling through the woods, poking some poor toad in the eyes, or trying to snip whiskers off a wolf. What do you think a wolf would do if you tried to nick his whiskers? Not just a wolf, said Gigi. A dark wolf. They're twice as big and vicious, and it won't do to poke a toad in the eyes. It would have to be born blind. Okay, said Lucas. So I guess we're totally out of luck. Is there any way the wand will work while it's in this state? I mean, I could try to see what some turpentine will do. Gigi took the brush and waved it through an intricate set of motions. He jabbed and flicked, and at times he looked like he was conducting an orchestra. No, said Gigi. It's defiled. The paint has encased its magical properties. Well, then what are we going to do? asked Lucas. We'll never be able to get those ingredients. Oh, I wouldn't say that, said Justin. I think I know exactly where we could find plenty of ingredients like that. Where? the boys said together. Rook's Place. Chapter 19 Into the Ruin Lucas never imagined he would voluntarily return to that wondrous, dreaded place yet again. The boys definitely would not have enough time to get to the Rook estate and back before curfew. Furthermore, if they came back without any game again, they might not be allowed to leave anymore. They surely did not have time to hunt and go to Rook's, therefore they decided to make it an all-night affair. First, they went to Gigi's house and told the Eridimaculums that they were all going to spend the night at the Leatherhide's house. Gigi was highly uncomfortable with lying to his parents. He almost botched the lie due to his stuttering and ranting. Then they went to Blake's house, where they told the Leatherhides that they were spending the night at the Eridimaculums house. Gretchen accepted Blake's lie wholeheartedly, for Blakey could do no wrong in her eyes. Then they went to Lucas's house, where Lucas and Justin retrieved their bows and quivers. It was painful for Lucas to be back there, as the absence of his godparents was a presence in and of itself. Leaving Devonstone was easier under the guise of a hunting expedition. This time, however, they knew the importance of bringing something back, so they hunted first. Justin tracked a buck along Collie Crest Ravine, a lowland, knee-deep stream through scattered trees. The trees were so far apart that the buck could not avoid Justin's keen eye. Lucas spooked it toward Justin, and they quickly felled it with two arrows. Blake and Lucas carried it to the Devonstone outskirts, where they hid it in some shrubbery. Meanwhile, Gigi spotted a wild boar, and Justin quickly took it down. The greedy soldiers would be pleased with their catch, thus less likely to be troublesome upon their return from Rook's. With their alibi successfully in place, the boys headed back to Rook's estate. It was dusk, which made the sight of her ruined mansion all the more eerie. The giant double doors had long since been broken down. Justin led the way, for he had been in the mansion before. Lucas, Gigi, and Blake followed slowly, constantly looking over their shoulders as if expecting to be clubbed at any moment. 
Bits of broken glass crunched loudly beneath their feet. It was a musky smell, for mold had invaded the interior, giving everything a slight green tinge. Justum had some wooden matches and used them to light several hanging lanterns. He carelessly tossed the lantern into the fireplace, where it shattered and ignited the logs within. Their dark surroundings slowly appeared before them in jerky, dim firelight. They were still in the foyer, which was adorned with master paintings. Each door was flanked by two once-shiny suits of armor. High above, on the second and third floors, were expansive balconies supported by massive arches from which intricate tapestries dangled. The windows were shrouded with red velvet drapery. The floor was black and white checkered marble. "'It'll take all night to find anything in here,' said Lucas, his voice echoing. Gigi was speechless as he stared at a mural painted on the ceiling, which depicted a classic battle scene between mixed groups of cavalry and infantry. "'Maybe I could find another sword in here, huh?' asked Blake. First, I guess we gotta find what we came here for. Where would she have kept gross things like blind toad eyes and wolf whiskers? Well, replied Gigi, she must have an alchemy lab somewhere. As a witch, she must have brewed up all sorts of potions. It would probably be somewhere cool and with good drainage. Let's check the basement. The basement, said Blake. That figures. Don't you mean dungeon? They each carried a lantern to light their path as they searched through the countless sitting rooms, studies, galleries, and bedrooms. The kitchen and dining room had no clues. Where were the stairs? Perhaps there was no basement. Justum, where is the library? asked Gigi. He could hardly wait to see the library full of magic books that Justum told him about last year. Maybe there will be something worthwhile there. It's toward the back. Follow me. Justin took them down a long hall with foot-thick crown molding. An ornate corridor was at the hall's end. The corridor opened up into the expansive library. The fresh smell of outside was immediately apparent, for the library had a ceiling that was mostly shattered skylight. Where there was once glass, now there was only a skeletal metal framework. They were surprised to see a black sky sprinkled with bright stars. It was late already. Much to their horror, scores of the Bone Horde's tentacles were dangling in through the skylight. The tendrils slithered, fruitlessly trying to reach the boys. They were in no danger, however, for the tendrils were at least twenty feet up and swarmed mainly as a reflex triggered by the boys' presence. Look how much that thing has grown, said Lucas. And in just one day, too. It had plenty to feed on lately, said Gigi. I'm afraid there's no limit to its growth. It don't even stay underground no more, said Blake. That's right, said Gigi. And it will probably keep growing. This whole mansion might eventually be absorbed by the thing, so we better clear out anything we might want or need while we still can. Good point. Justum liked the sound of that advice. Gigi was disappointed to see that many of the books were turned into mulch by rain and mold. Bookcases were tipped and there were book piles everywhere. He dug deep and found several books still intact. Justum tore down some long drapes and he used them to bundle up their loot. Every bookcase had fallen, except one, which drew Gigi's attention. This bookcase is still attached to the wall, it seems, said Gigi. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a passage hidden behind here. They simultaneously pushed on the bookcase to no avail. It would not budge. They fumbled about, not fully knowing what they were searching for. When Justin pushed on a slightly protruded brick, there was a loud click. Blake gave the bookcase a nudge, and to their surprise, it moved. There was a loud creak, and the bookcase crashed loudly to the floor. The bone horde's tentacles went hyperactive. The fallen bookcase revealed a stone archway, beyond which was a spiral stairway shrouded in pitch blackness. So, Blake sighed, I suppose we're going down there. Justin led the way down the spiraling stairs. The blackness was so solid that the world seemed to exist only within the short area of their lantern light. Upon reaching the bottom, they found what they sought. 
There were a dozen wooden tables, covered with loopy, spiraling glass apparatuses, flasks, mortars, pestles, beakers, and stacks of black cauldrons. Pay dirt! Blake's voice was loud. When he spoke, a noise like loud rain suddenly sounded, but it came from below rather than above. It was the noise of the bone hordes, many roots beneath the foundation, trying to wiggle their way through the stone floor. It tried desperately to reach the young morsels just beyond the stubborn stone barrier. Here it is, said Gigi. He had opened a thick wooden door which led to a storeroom. There was a ladder that needed to be climbed to access the many shelves of various ingredients. The shelves were lined with neatly labeled jars filled with disgusting objects. Gigi started sorting through them. Serpent urine? No. Bone hoard mucus? No. Snorkalf spinal fluid? No. Cinnamon? Gross! I hate cinnamon. Don't forget, said Blake. Also find stuff that'll make the potion to get rid of my skunk smell. Don't worry, Blake, said Gigi. I only need common ingredients for that, stuff we can find anywhere. There's mostly exotic materials here. They found a section devoted solely to toads. Here, look! Lucas held up a jar which had an aging yellow label. Eye of Toad, Blind. They found a section devoted to rare obsidian organisms, where they luckily found dark wolf whiskers. Just him shook the jar and the thick black whiskers tinkled. Blake spotted a jar full of fine powder, which turned out to be ground wisp beak. They had everything they needed. Before leaving, they scooped up anything that seemed remotely interesting. Their makeshift drapery sacks were bulging and heavy when they reluctantly decided to leave. Their greedy pilfering made the trip back to Devonstone a heavy burden. Justum showed them the best places to stash their loot until they could retrieve it piecemeal without suspicion. Then they retrieved the game. A small fox found their hidden buck, and Blake kicked it, which sent the pitiful animal sailing about ten feet before it hit the ground running. Lucas and Blake carried the buck while Gigi and Justum carried the boar. It was dawn when they shuffled into Devonstone, exhausted. Looks like we're having a feast tonight, said a Black Eagle soldier when he spotted the boys. What you stopping for? I ain't carrying them bloody things. Drop them off at the plaza and then straight home with you. Don't slice off nothing neither. The men are hungry. Their plan went more smoothly than they ever anticipated. Tomorrow they would resurrect Lucas's wand and make Blake smell like a bed of roses. Chapter 20 20 F's and 2 A's Lucas was running from an angry mob. There he is, yelled Gigi. He's the tyrant king. Kill him. Blake and Justin were chasing him as well. Mrs. Leafton was crazed and wielding a six-foot battle axe. A swarm of blind toads flooded the streets, distracting everyone. Thus, he was able to escape the crowd. When he turned the corner, he was faced with an army of Merryweathers. The army was led by General Kalovenhoof, who barked the order, Wake Lucas! The Merryweathers chanted as they smothered Lucas with their purple hair, Wake Lucas! Wake Lucas! Wake Lucas! At that point, Lucas realized what was happening before he actually woke up. Deary Thomas was shaking Lucas's shoulder as he sat behind his desk in history class. Come on, get up, Lucas. Lucas, said Mr. Clovenhoof, go stand at the back of the class. Blake was starving. Hundreds of the bone hoard's roots dangled perfectly roasted marshmallows above his head, just barely out of reach. His mother was there. You can have some pudding pie after you drink all your snorkalf spinal fluid, she said. Ugh, he grunted. A little fox leaped out and repeatedly kicked him in the shin. His mother morphed into Darlene Millie. Oh, what's that smell, she said. It's you! Get away from me, skunk face! It was true. He felt his face. He had the head of a skunk. Blake! yelled Mr. Clovenhoof. You too? Get to the back of the class and stand with your buddy. Just him was swimming through a sea of money. 
when he reached a shore of gold coins, he was greeted by a crowd of beautiful women. Hi, Timmy. We're here to give you a massage. Timothy! Kolovenhoof yelled again. Stop moaning and get up. You know where to go. Did I, did I miss some big party last night or something? Justin shuffled to the back of the class. The queen was pinning a medal to Gigi's chest. I hereby proclaim you a high mage of the woodland realm, she said. An airship floated down and he boarded it. He flew high and far until he reached the cloudy lands of Varaxia, the sky realm. A crowd of Varaxians bowed to him. I shall restore peace to the world, said Gigi. He awoke to the sound of the class laughing. Please do, Geraticus, said Mr. Kolovenhoof. While you're busy with world peace, perhaps you could find time to join your friends at the back of the class. Honestly, what did you four get into last night? The rest of their classes went much the same way. The day was filled with dreams interrupted by the sporadic reality of school. They awoke in art class to Mrs. Leafton poking them. Math class was echoing jumbled numbers. Literature class was random voices. Music class was deep, luxurious sleep. When they reached the chemistry lab of their science class, they were riled and refreshed. Gigi sifted through the stockpiles in the classroom's cabinets and found all the necessary common ingredients he needed. Here, Blake, said Gigi as he handed Blake a list. Find these ingredients and mash them up with a mortar and pestle. He handed Blake another parchment. Mix those according to these instructions. That'll be everything you need for your stink nullifying potion. Oh, thanks, Gigi. This is our list, Lucas, said Gigi as he held up a long parchment with tiny writing. Lucas began mashing ingredients while Gigi carefully stirred and mixed various liquids in a pan over a burner. With a pipette, he added a little of this and a little of that into a beaker. The concoction bubbled. What are you making, Geraticus? asked their chemistry professor. It's a cleaning solution. It will return anything to its original state. We're going to try it on this encrusted paintbrush. The teacher laughed. Don't waste your time. I don't think anything could get that brush clean. The teacher strolled to Blake, who was feverishly working. Blake, nice to see you hard at work. What are you attempting? I'm making a brew that'll make me smell good again. My, my, everyone's so ambitious today. Very well. Continue. I do hope it works. Just him and Lucas scrambled back and forth, handing Gigi various ingredients as he commanded. They were most careful when handling the precious rare ingredients from Rook's estate. Occasionally, they handed Blake something he needed. In their frantic busyness, time passed much too quickly. Class was almost over. Gigi squinted at the beaker while sloshing the fluid around. It changed from green to red to blue back to green. Gigi, said Blake. Look here, I think mine's done. Blake displayed a beaker full of something that looked like pink lemonade, complete with little bits floating in it. What do I do with it? Drink it, said Gigi while heavily concentrating on putting a pinch of something into the potion he was working on. Blake took a deep breath, then chugged the liquid as fast as he could. He smacked his lips. Uh, that's not bad, actually. He tapped out a few more drops into his open mouth. He stood silent, waiting for absolution, or perhaps to turn green, or explode. Nothing happened. Give it a moment, said Gigi. It needs time to work through your system. Meanwhile, Gigi was putting the finishing touches on his potion. Okay, class, said the teacher. Time's almost up. I'm coming around to check your work. Hang on, hang on. Gigi's hands were a blur as he worked, stopping only to wipe sweat from his brow. That should do it. He finished as the teacher approached. The soupy brown mixture bubbled in its beaker. It looked like anything submerged into the solution would only become dirtier. Well, Geraticus, said the teacher, let's have a demonstration. Lucas handed Gigi the brush wand. Gigi hesitated for a second and then dropped the brush into the beaker. 
there was a bright flash, like lightning, and everyone flinched. A mushroom cloud of white smoke puffed. The potion became crystal clear, revealing an immaculate brush. It worked. Amazing! shouted the teacher. That's an A if I've ever seen one. I'd like to see your paperwork. Show me how you reversed molecular cohesion. Gigi and the teacher talked at length about technical matters far beyond the other students, sounding like they were speaking a foreign language. Then, the teacher suddenly stopped and sniffed the air. You smell that? He turned to Blake. There could have been a field of wildflowers in the room. Blake, are you, are you wearing perfume? No, sir. That's my brew I made. Guess it worked. Blake proudly stuck out his chest and rocked up and down on his feet. The teacher smelled his beaker and coughed. Well, you did succeed. I don't smell that foul odor anymore. Actually, you smell rather lovely. Reminds me of my wife. A. Whoa, I ain't never got no A before. Can't imagine why, said the teacher as he walked away. Blake, hissed Gigi. How many lily petals did you put in that potion? Blake examined his list of ingredients. S six Gigi snatched the parchment out of his hands. That's not a six. That's a five. Oh, well, it looked like six to me. Blake snapped his fingers. Now that I think on it, I remember putting in double. Twelve. I thought that might help cover the stink better. Congratulations, said Gigi. You'll never need another bath. Never mind that, said Lucas. Will this work now? He held up his brush wand. Let's find out, replied Gigi as the rest of the class was filing out to go home. Point it at that beaker and move it exactly like this. Gigi used a normal brush to demonstrate the movement. Lucas emulated the motion perfectly, and the beaker shattered. Whoa! It really works! Gigi laughed. Now, point it at the shards and do this. He waved his brush again. Lucas carefully observed the motion and copied it with collovium. The glass shards reversed, converging like a puzzle. After taking shape, the cracks disappeared and it was a flawless beaker again. Congratulations, said Gigi. You are now probably the most powerful person in the woodland realm.